Hello, IB Environmental students. Today we're going to be talking about communities and ecosystems. Let's jump in. What is a community? What is an ecosystem? Communities are a group of organisms of different species all working together. All right? They don't actually have to be interacting too much, but they're in an area together. So we have a population of zebra, and we have a population of gazelle, and they're interacting together. Notice that they're both biotic in a community. An ecosystem, on the other hand, is not just the biotic. It is also the physical abiotic environment. So on top of those creatures, we're also going to include, when we talk about an ecosystem, the water, the soil, the rocks, because those things are abiotic, on top of all the biotic things we were talking about with the community. All right, so now that we have those definitions, we're going to be referring to a lot of things about communities and ecosystems. The first thing is that within a community, organisms are going to be eating one another, and we will make food chains and trophic levels out of that. So an autotroph is something that does photosynthesis and makes its own food using the resources carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. Now, there are some organisms that don't do photosynthesis that are also producers. Instead of calling them um, photosynthesizers, they are chemosynthetic organisms because instead of sunlight, they use chemical compounds such as methane to make their own food. A lot of the most well-known ones are from the deep ocean, and they're usually bacteria. All other organisms that don't make their own food, producers, are considered consumers. The fancy way of saying consumers is called heterotrophs. Troph meaning they eat and Hetero meaning different. They eat different things. Like a human eats lots of different things. They can't make their own food. Heterotrophs and consumers are considered primary, secondary, tertiary, depending on where along the food chain they are. So let's draw a food chain. So here's a food chain. Notice that the arrow points at the consumer's mouth. So a primary consumer is going to eat a producer. And so we point the arrow in that direction. But this is a food chain. Why is it a chain? Because it's only one thing eating another thing eating another thing. A food web is a lot more complex, has a lot of food chains combined, All right? So a food chain, only one pathway, and we can see how matter is transferring between these different organisms, All right? Chemical energy moving here, moving here, moving here, All right? We also have matter, like carbon, moving between each of them as well. A food web, again, is complex. It's a lot of interconnected chains within an ecosystem. This is a more realistic model because it is more complex and it takes account more things. All right, let's keep going. So there's a lot of players in a food web, and we as IB students have to really understand what these terms are and what they do for the ecosystem. So I've created this table to help us keep everything organized. So producers, all right, they're primary producers, they're the first level, they use solar energy, they're autotrophs. What do they do? Well, they're providing energy, they provide habitat, they also supply nutrients, and they help with erosion. Primary consumers that are the next thing, well, they're eating these plants, they're herbivores, right? They disperse seeds, they consume these green plants, they keep the green plants in check by eating them. Secondary and tertiary consumers are usually going to be omnivores or carnivores. They are going to consume those herbivores. If they're, um, if they're omnivores, they might also have some plants. Sometimes these things pollinate flowers. Sometimes they will remove old and deceased um, things from the environment if they are um, going to be uh, like things like vultures and scavengers. And then we have these two other groups. All right, we have decomposers and we have detritivores. Detritivores is usually a weird word that we gloss over when we do little entry-level biology classes. So let's compare these two things. They have a lot of overlap, but they're slightly different. Decomposers are bacteria and fungi. They're going to de um, break down dead and decaying organisms by secreting enzymes. Um, but detritivores, right, they're going to actually consume um, the primary producers. Both, though, um, are going to be doing this breakdown, right? They're both heterotrophs. They're both breaking down this dead stuff. It's just all about which of these types of organisms are in these categories. They're both considered heterotrophs. They both are involved in um, the release of nutrients back into the matter cycle, such as carbon, water, 
nitrogen, we really, really depend on these things to help us cycle our nutrients. Without them, we would be devastated in our ecosystems. We very much need these players. But just don't forget, a lot of students like to remember that um, all of these things that are the breakdown of matter, they call them FBI. Right, fungus, bacteria, and then all of these things, other than vultures, are um, invertebrates, meaning they don't have backbone. So FBI. Now, there's also a couple other things we have to go through today, which are called ecological pyramids. A pyramid is a picture diagram that is a graphical model that represents the quantitative or number differences between the living matter stored at different trophic levels on a food chain. Why do we do this? This helps us be able to talk about the health of an ecosystem, the different organisms on the ecosystem. They're very visual, so they're pretty helpful. And we have three types. Here's our first type. This is the pyramid of numbers. It refers to a standing crop. The unit is the number of organisms in a particular area, such as number meters squared. Why might I like this type of pyramid? Well, it's easy to collect the data for the most part, right? I can count the number of organisms. Cons, well, depending on the organism's size, it might be really hard to collect this data, such as grass. Counting the number of grass is really tough. It doesn't account for if the organisms are young babies or old organisms. It also doesn't count uh, account for um, how big they are. If they're really fat, that's what size was also talking about. And again, if it's grass or plants and there's so many of the organisms, we might need specific estimating sampling strategies that we'll learn later on in class. Just know that there are some examples that might be a little weird for pyramid of numbers that don't necessarily look like our generic uh, triangle that looks like this one. That might be such as this rotting log. A rotting log is an example of an inverted pyramid of numbers because one rotting tree could be a, a place where thousands of insects, herbivores, and leaf-eating invertebrates live. So even though there's only one producer organism, so there's tons of invertebrates. So it almost looks like an upside-down triangle. The next one is the pyramid of biomass. Biomass also shows standing crop, but instead of counting each individual organism, I'm referring to the mass, which is similar to weight but not exactly, of the organic matter in the organisms in the ecosystem. Usually we're going to look at dry weight biomass. Why? Because that's the removal of water. Because water doesn't have any energy to it. And biomass is really exciting because it's going to lead us to be able to understand how much energy is going to have in the ecosystem. So the unit is mass per area. The pros is now we're accounting for organism size. Is this a fat frog or a little frog? That also helps us think about was it a baby frog or was it a big frog? Cons. It's really difficult to measure this for a large sampling area because now not only do I have to count them, but I actually have to capture the organism. And because it's dry weight, well, if I'm capturing this frog, now I have to kill it. And that's not usually thought to be ethical and so I have to dry it out which usually takes an oven. It also might be different depending on time of year. Grass and other plants are going to be bigger especially after the spring when they have a lot more rain and water compared to times like the summer or times like the winter. Also, um, some organisms might be the same mass but they might have different amounts of energy. We know things like fat are going to hold a lot more energy. Think like comparing a, um, a blubbery whale, which is going to have a lot of fat, to a lot of other organisms that don't have as much fat. Last but not least type of pyramid is pyramid of productivity. This is going to be the flow of biomass or energy over time. Notice this isn't standing crop. It's all about flow. So this is going to be usually in joules. Sometimes it's in calories because that is about energy. Notice that it's also in an area, but now it's over a particular time. That is what we talk about when we are meaning flow. It's over a time. That's new. Pro. Well, that idea. It's over a particular time. So this accounts for seasonal changes and whatnot. 
con. This is again going to be difficult to measure because I'm also going to be measuring biomass again. And it has very complex calculations and it is a little hard to assign um, one species to a particular trophic level such as humans. We're omnivores. We eat lots of different things. So it's hard to put us in a particular category when we would do something like this. This relates very much to the second law of thermodynamics. Don't forget that as we move between trophic levels, 10% of the energy moves between each level. So here we have a representation. Uh, if we start with 1,000 units, now we only have 100. 100 is 10% of 1,000. Where did the 90% go? Again, don't forget that that is going to become heat, um, and that's related to our idea of entropy, which is disorder in a system. A lot of times we can call it not only heat, but respiration. So at each trophic level, a little bit is lost as respiration. We're going to learn more about that in the future in this unit as well. So we have two more last words that are related to thinking about things moving up a food chain and up a uh, trophic levels. That are these two words called bioaccumulation and biomagnification, which sound a lot alike. And we're going to learn about how these impact society in class. Bioaccumulation, meaning accumulate, is the chemicals that are taken up and accumulate in an organism's body by eating. Biomagnification means not only are the chemicals accumulating in a particular organism, but biomagnification means that they're magnifying up the pyramid. So biomagnification means that there are some types of chemicals that don't break down because of the help of decomposers, and they enter the food chain. This is entering the food chain, bioaccumulate, but they magnify. So each time something else is eaten, that it affects more and more. So which part of the food chain is most affected by biomagnification? The upper trophic levels, our predatory species. This is something that has been in environmental law and policy for a really long time because there are particular persistent compounds that don't biodegrade, such as DDT, that have affected not only um, fish, but really things like birds and eagles that we've really much worried about how they might be toxic to those organisms. And we'll talk about that in class. Wonderful job. This was a long one. I'm very proud of you.